Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Honorary <laughs> guests, we would like to welcome you all to the three plenary three session of the 19th International Anti-Corruption Conference. We would like to welcome you all and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Kim Yeonjin, your MC for this session. It is my great honor and my pleasure to meet all of you. IACC 2020 is now being live streamed for all global attendees and simultaneously interpreted uh, in six UN official languages and Korean. Uh, for the speakers on Zoom, if you need translation, you could choose the language by clicking the global icon on the bottom of the Zoom. As I mentioned earlier, the live streaming is available in all seven languages, including six UN official languages and Korean for global attendees. You could choose language you want on the agenda of the web page. Please note that. And for your information, the studio in Korea has been complying with all the requested COVID-19 quarantine measures required by the government. And uh, this session is being held under the theme of collective action for trust and integrity. During this session, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in chat window. Today, we have invited moderator, Ms. Christina Lee, head of uh, publications host writer. So, Ms. Christina Lee, when you're ready, please proceed. Wonderful, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much to everyone who's joining us for this session, the third plenary session, uh, which is entitled Collective Action for Trust and Integrity. In this session, we will be discussing the challenge of regaining trust in institutions and joint mechanisms that tackle corruption and transparency in the face of current ongoing threats from above and below. From above, we have the issue of a wave of nationalist political movements that have been undermining efforts at international cooperations, politicians and political movements that rail against ethnic and religious minorities, against the free press and the global elites, and accuse international institutions of globalist conspiracies. Now, while a lot of this ends up being just talk, it has also resulted in some cases in action, such as the United States withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accords and the WHO, Britain's withdrawal from the EU, and a number of countries retreating from the Istanbul Convention on Domestic Violence. At the same time, accusations and even evidence of corruption are undermined by relentless attacks on the media by those who are accused of corruption, we see from below also the spread of conspiracy theories, disinformation, and um, efforts to undermine trust in science, the media, and institutions that work in the public interest. These communities continue to be polarized by divisive and exclusionary politics that cast blame on, for all social ills onto minorities, the LGBT community, religious groups, immigrants, etc. And these two forms of threats have made it very difficult to engage in efforts to uh, uh, have global cooperation against um, corruption, even when the laws are already in place to do so. At the same time, we still have an even more of a problem with the coronavirus that has uh, been a thing that has also undermined the uh, public's trust and authorities to actually tackle global issues together with cooperation and resiliency. So in this session, we're going to be talking to a group of panelists that have a wide range of experience in the fields of human rights, in business, as well as in nonprofit organizations and government about how we can restore trust and transparency, uh, international cooperation and human rights. I would like to um, introduce our panelists to you. First, I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Christina Lee. I'm joining from Berlin, Germany, and I'm hoping to moderate the session and highlight some takeaways that we can have in order to uh, gain understanding of what can be done to better strengthen our institutions. I'd like to introduce our panelist, Andrew Gilmore who is the executive director of the Burkhoff Foundation, a nonprofit organization that works around the world to create space for conflict transformation. Before joining um, the Burkhoff Foundation in May 2020, Andrew served for 30 years at the United Nations, most recently as the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights from 2016 to 2019, and as political director in the office of the Secretary General in New York from 2012 to 2016. We're very happy to have you with us, Mr. Gilmore. Also joining us today is Ololobi Makinwa, the Chief of Intergovernmental Relations in Africa at the United Nations Global Compact. 
During her tenure as the Chief of Transparency and Anti-Corruption, she has successfully led the development of numerous UN Global Compact projects on transparency and anti-corruption, most notably the Siemens Initiative Project and Collective Action in the Fight Against Corruption. Prior to joining the UN Global Compact, Ms. McKinwell was the Executive Director of Amnesty International in South Africa. Thanks for joining us today. In addition, we have Mr. Uh, Kim Jong Kap, who is the president and CEO of Korea's Electric Power Corporation. Previously, he was the chairman and CEO of Siemens Limited Seoul, the chairman and H uh, CEO of Hynix Semiconductor Inc Incorporated, the vice minister of commerce, industry, and energy of South Korea, and the commissioner of Korea Intellectual Property Office of South Korea. Thank you so much for joining us. Also joining us today is Mauricio Claver Corone, who's the president of the Inter-American Development Bank. As the president of the IDB, he also chairs the board of executive directors at IDB Invest, which is the private sector arm of the IDB, as well as the donors committee of IDB Lab, which is the bank's incubator for innovative development projects. Prior to his election um, to the IDB, he was the principal, a principal advisor to President Donald Trump, serving as the deputy assistant to the President of the United States and senior director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council. From 2017 to 2018, Mr. Clever Corone served as the senior advisor for international affairs at the US Department of Treasury. Very happy to have you all with us today. Also joining us today is Mr. Mark Moody Stewart, who has such a long uh, list of, uh, of things under his biography that I can't get to them all, unfortunately, but <laughs> uh, he is currently the chairman of the Global Compact Foundation. Before that, he was the chairman of the Royal Dutch and Shell Group um, and of uh, Anglo-American PLC. He has a doctorate of uh, geology in Cambridge and has worked for Shell in a number of different countries. And he is also the author of Responsible Leadership, Lessons from the Frontline of Sustainability and Ethics. Thank you for being with us today, Mr. Moody Stewart. Finally, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Boniface Mwangi, who is a photojournalist turned activist turned politician, uh, who has been described as Kenya's most popular leader in the fight against government corruption and injustice. In addition to being here with us on the panel today, he is also the subject of a documentary film called Softy, which is playing as part of the Films for Transparency Film Festival. Before we jump in with our panelists to discuss the topic at hand, we would like to watch the trailer for this film, which will be available through the film festival part of the ISCC. And um, we could start it as soon as possible. My father who put me in heaven, or my dad got hurt by the police. Please tell him to get a better job. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Amen. Kenya has been ranked dismally as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. MP, 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 MP. I know you have a right. You have a right for this. I Boniface Mwangi, folks. This young man is one word, fearless. Why are you arresting me? Why are you arresting me? Why are you arresting me? What about you? What about you? What about you? Yes, of course. We're going to topple the government. I can only imagine how scared I'd be seeing my husband taken to the streets. Now he wants to try his hand at politics. What? My heart is made up that I'm going to fight. <laughs> this is how you're telling it. I go to Sawa and you go to a very well. Sent. You want to be a good Does one first one have uh, deep pockets? No, he doesn't. Is he on the right side of uh, the tribal kingpin? No, he's not. He is uh, going to be a casualty of other forces beyond him. Do not come home. They will kill you. Activist Boneface Wangi receiving death threats that for the first time target his wife and children as well. It feels like just jumping into a river of crocodiles.
Thank you very much for playing that. Um, Boniface, I'd love to jump right to you just for a couple of minutes to talk about the film. I was wondering if you could give us some of the key takeaways that you would like people to understand about the situation that is being depicted in the film. So the film is about, thank you very much, uh, Christine. Christina, the film is about um, me running for public office and the challenges that I went through, but it goes back historically to how Kenya became a corrupt country. So if you go back to the pre-independence day when we were not, we were still colonized. People used to fund politicians, uh, they funded the freedom movement, and they used to fund anyone who was going to public life or public office. And then fast forward on I'm Vine about 50 years later after independence, is that when you want to run for public office, you must have a lot of money. And so when I was going to Vi, people were asking for money, they want to be bribed, and my rivals were multi-millionaires, like in dollar millionaires, and they were bribing voters to buy votes. So the whole idea for the film is to show that the, the struggle in our country of what colonization did to our country by dividing the country through tribalism and through ethnic politics and through money politics and trying to change the way politics is done, trying to get back people to where we used to be, that for someone to become a public servant, it is okay for you to fund their campaign. So that's the whole idea, that's the takeaway from the movie, how, how corruption and how tribalism and how colonization affected how we do leadership on the continent. It's an interesting um, uh, point about this uh, connection between polarization, colonization, and corruption, how these things are often playing in uh, interplay with one another. Do you think that um, having more, more people who like you get involved in politics is one of the ways to fight back against this type of polarization? Yes, I believe that, but there is need to be much more than that. So if you look at the continent, we're the most corrupt continent in the world. But the biggest companies on our continent are multinationals. So you find a Swiss citizen or someone from the UK or an American company going to come to Africa and either fund militia, fund a government to fund, fund the overthrow of a democratically elected president, uh, find, find or pay business on the continent, but they're never held accountable. So the only way we can fight corruption, systemic, cor systemic corruption on our continent is to have a partnership, not only with the leaders on this continent, but companies that work here, but have that approach. Because in this continent, people who bribe corporations or multinationals are never held accountable, but it, it could be work much better if people who do business on the continent are held accountable in the countries they come from. So if you involve in corruption abroad and you're registered in your country, you're held accountable on the other side. So if we fight our fight as Africans and as a Kenyan on this side, I want partnership with people in other countries to ensure that people who are doing business on this side of the continent are held accountable and practice uh, good policies and do business with integrity and do it in a clean way. Because when companies that are registered abroad do business on the continent, they break all manner of rules. They pollute, they bribe, they, they make up violence, they do all manner of things, but they don't do those things in their own countries. So I only wish that as we try to change our politics and change the other things that are done here, we'd like partnership with other people to do that on the, to ensure that people who do business here, but they're not Africans, do not do an African things, or they don't, because corruption is not us. Bribery is not African, it, was ne it never used to be there. If you look at the history of our continent, before we were colonized, we didn't have bribery or words for corruption in our languages. There are words that came along with, came along with slavery and colonization. They were never part of us. There's a couple of very interesting points that I think we have some uniquely qualified panelists to discuss um, later on, particularly the topic of accountability for what companies do in countries outside of their own, ensuring that they are held accountable for the same standards no matter where they operate, but also the question of having partnerships that extend both internationally but also between public and private bodies to ensure that there's standards that are uh, matched and held to no matter uh, where one is operating. I think that our panelists today are particularly good, well set up to discuss this topic. Um, thank you very much for Boniface. And this film, uh, Softy, will be available with the IACC's um, Films for Transparency Festival, and I um, believe it will be in, uh, available elsewhere as well. But please check it out.
Um, we would now like to move to the discussion of our uh, key problem statement. So I will just restate what the problem statement is, and then we're going to discuss, um, we're going to have a chance for each of the panelists to weigh in on the topic, and then we will move to a more general discussion, also allowing for the audience to um, ask questions of anyone in particular or to the group as a whole. So our problem statement is as follows. The anti-corruption movement has succeeded in placing corruption, transparency, and integrity at the center of the global agenda with numerous conventions, laws, partnerships, and commitments firmly rooted in national and international institutions. However, governments and international bodies have fallen short in their implementation and enforcement, contributing to the erosion of public trust. The return to non-democratic and nationalistic tendencies and continuous attacks to international cooperation is further reducing trust levels between citizens and public institutions to historic lows. Against this backdrop in countries from all regions, the COVID-19 pandemic is fueling social tension and political polarization. The reemergence of racial and ethnic politics, as well as the rise of radical movements are challenges that call for collective action to restore trust and promote political integrity. Social cohesion and trust are critical for effective government accountability. So how can we strengthen our current and future alliances if we already have the laws and institutions in place? How can we reinvigorate our common objective to restore trust? Now we're going to go to the panelists who will each speak for a few minutes on this topic before we debate a little bit more openly. I would like to start with Mr. Moody Stewart. Thank you very much, Christina. And can I start by expressing my deep respect for Boniface and others in Africa who are fighting against corrupt governments and corrupt companies. Uh, and I also support his, his proposition that, that foreign companies should be held to the standards of their own countries as well and be prosecutable in, uh, in their own countries. I think we've seen there's a general agreement that if we're to address this scourge of corruption, collaboration is essential. How do we collaborate and what does each partner in the collaboration bring to the party and how do we build the trust? Now, I speak from the point of view of a business person and business, as Boniface said, is often seen as part of the problem and in cases of grand corruption, a business is often a collaborator and indeed is the source of the bribe, the fountain of the problem. But business is also a source of expertise. If a company is honest and committed not to pay bribes, that doesn't mean that we do not have problems with corruption. The companies that I've worked with uh, over many years, the major resource companies, develop major projects. And we have to fight against what I call incoming bribes. People who try to corrupt the system of awarding of contracts. And we've developed systems of letting contracts which avoid this risk. And if we weren't reasonably good at it, we would go out of business because the, the, there would be enormous loss of money in the process. Transparency is the key. I think open contracting processes, which are much discussed in this uh, conference, are very important. Independent hotlines, I think, are, are fundamental so that our own people, and most importantly, contractors who are honest in case of any problem can report it and feel comfortable to do that. Uh, in Saudi Aramco, a major oil company on whose board I sit, has such hotlines, as well as making absolutely clear on their website that you do not need intermediaries to deal with the company. Unfortunately, bidding companies from Western countries sometimes make unwarranted assumptions about accepted or expected behavior in certain regions. Equally, uh, it's not just about award of contracts. We have to be rigorous in the transparency of our recruiting systems, avoiding shortcuts, requests from ministers to employ a cousin and, and so on. All of these things 
small though they may be individually, are fundamental to be rejected, to avoid preferences for ethnic or preferred groups. You need, frankly, your eyes and ears open all the time. But if we do get it right, and we certainly do not always get it right, we can use our own business practices as examples to governments on how to run bidding processes in which we ourselves, in resource companies, may be uh, the bidder. If our own processes are exemplary, we can build trust and form alliances with civil society organizations to press for transparent government uh, contracts and transparency in those contracts. Support from other governments can also be helpful, but it's not universally forthcoming. Several times in my career, I have seen a major Western government put pressure on a smaller or in some way dependent uh, country to distort what was actually a fully transparent process in favor of a company of its own nationality to the detriment of others. I hope that that's more unusual today than during my long career, but I'm not so sure. So if governments are corrupt, what can a non-corrupt company do and how can alliances help? Let me give some examples. In the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, a number of Congolese companies grouped together to set up a local network of the UN Global Compact. They were, had valuable support from the uh, uh, embassy of the Netherlands, but it was very much their initiative. And when I visited uh, the Kinshasa for the opening of this process, I found that one of the driving forces of these Congolese companies was to address corruption in government, which they said was their biggest uh, problem. And they hoped and felt that collectively, using the UN Global Compact umbrella, they should be able to raise their concerns on the subject collectively, rather than trying to take action as individual companies. There is no whistleblower protection for companies. If you complain about it, you are likely to get penalized uh, and not rewarded. Uh, of course, a collective approach under something like the United Nations Global Compact or with the help of Transparency International can make cooperation with civil society organizations in the uh, UN Global Compact much more possible and begin to build the trust, which is absolutely essential and which is often lacking, of course. Secondly, I'd like to take an example in the healthcare industry. I had a discussion once with a French company uh, who was manufacturing and exporting medical devices, not my field at all. And the person responsible explained that she felt that in, she knew that in some countries, in order to receive an essential license from the Ministry of Health, it was also necessary to employ agents. And she knew that some of those agents made uh, corrupt uh, payments. Uh, while she was opposed to such a practice and felt that the population, uh, she felt that the population would have no access to vital life-saving equipment if she didn't do this. And she felt, therefore, that her choice on balance, difficult decision, was a moral one. Now, clearly, it's very difficult for an individual company to make a, an individual complaint in such a case. As I said, there's no whistleblower protection for the company. However, if a group of companies in that sector can aggregate their examples and perhaps anonymize them, and then work in a spirit of trust with a civil society organization who can use that data to bring it, the practice to the light with the press and perhaps with examples, I think a change can come. And that's important. Such cooperation, however, requires a spirit of trust as well as a willingness on all sides to, con uh, to consider 
somewhat uh, unconventional approach. Lastly, I think cooperation between governments uh, can be helpful and between governments and companies. I was very encouraged to hear of the, at this conference of the G20 Riyadh initiative being explained yesterday in this conference by Mohammed al Dekail of the Saudi Oversight and Anti-Corruption Authority. The proposal was to set up in Vienna under the broad auspices of the UN, an agency where government agencies, anti-corrupt agencies, could exchange confidentially information on corrupt practices and what they knew about it, to have a kind of clearinghouse confidential. And I think that has a lot of uh, potential. But I would suggest that one somehow adds to it, and it's very difficult, a way of getting companies to provide information and to seek information. Because when you have a difficult issue, someone is asking you for a bribe, you have to work a way around it. Say no, but then how do you avoid the consequences? What can you do? And there can be help, I think, through government agencies to do this. And I've seen it on occasion where cooperation between an individual company and the, and the government agency has resulted in the removal or exposure of some bad actors. So I hope that those are some useful suggestions and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rudy Stewart making some very interesting points, emphasizing collaboration, having proper incentives and having uh, more cooperation between businesses and civil society. Uh, now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Gilmore for his perspective. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm thrilled to be here. I would say that one of the, our major challenges is the fact that there really is an inextricable linkage between corruption and so many of the other problems that we face, combined with most people's lack of awareness that there is this linkage and consequently the fact that there is not a, a common uh, resistance to them. I believe it's absolutely not a coincidence that it's often exactly the same people uh, leaders I'm talking about who are who we know are basically are corrupt in some form or another who are also primarily responsible for so many of our other problems because such people are quite often for example climate change deniers or they claim that COVID is a is a hoax or over an exaggeration or or that they are authoritarian populists in their heart or their their tweets or they um they're often those that carry out measures that are that undermine national institutions, democracy, rule of law, freedom of the press, and human rights, and who are often most ready to whip up nationalism and threaten domestic and international peace, and who often do their utmost to undermine those multilateral institutions that were, after all, designed to deal with the exact global threats that we're currently facing. So, and I, I need to point out which particular departing world leader most obviously encapsulates all of those points. But the fact that so many NGOs and activists of, uh, on so many fronts are confronted by, by common enemies um, should surely mean, but alas, I don't think it does, that uh, there should be more of a common front in resisting them. We also need to recognize that um, the corruption, of course, is a means that such leaders carry out, used by such leaders to carry out the rest of their agenda. Though in some cases, it is also their goal. Because of course it's often it is corruption when the organs of a state are are misused to bolster the personal rule and, and finances of, of the ruling family and it's another form of corruption though still corruption when news organizations um, enable all the problems we, that we face by by knowingly peddling false facts about say the, the son of a of a political opponent or climate change or COVID, or, or electoral officials, or electoral results, or judicial proceedings. And it, it is corruption, and it should be called out as such, whether the motivation is to support a corrupt leader, or, or whether it is just to improve ratings. 
um, and whether it's the Murdoch Owned Press or QAnon or whatever, I, I think we should be aware that it is actually a form of corruption. And so, and accompanying this trend, of course, of, of of the media doing this of, is a global undermining of, of trust in institutions and one I think is greater than any of us have experienced actually in our in our lives and accompanying this trend to undermine public trust is the undermining of NGOs with well over a hundred governments I don't have the exact number that in the last eight years have passed rather tough in most, most cases laws to restrict the activities of NGOs whether human rights or rule of law or, or democracy or corruption. I think during the course of this excellent week that you've been organizing, a, a number of people have spoken about the link between corruption and conflict, and it, it's undeniable, and the corruption and the resentments of those who are who suffer as a result, either economically or politically through exclusion and unfairness, is of course a major driver of conflict. And similarly, conflict drives, leads to corruption because war economies are based on utterly corrupt practices and the, the, the desire to enrich oneself through conflict and the economic conditions that accompany conflict often contributes to the motivation to keep on fighting and we, we saw that in the wars of the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, Colombia, Liberia and now Libya and Somalia and many others. So, so what needs to change? I mean I, I would say that the mediation and peace of the community that the Berkhoff uh, Foundation is, is a part of, um, tends to take the view, understandably, but, but sometimes wrongly, that, that because there is nothing more important than peace, because you can't, in the absence of peace, advance on development or human rights or anti-corruption or climate change or whatever. And therefore, they, anything that might upset the parties to conflict or even distract them and makes them less amenable to, to making peace has to be avoided. And, and this means that there is a temptation to focus only on the short term and to, in, in order to remove the personal obstacles of war leaders to making peace. And that is why peacemakers and mediators can get a bit irritated with the human rights, whether it's with the human rights community or the anti-corruption community or the climate change or the gender community and lead them in effect to say, look, of course your issues are important, but for God's sake, be real. We have to focus on stopping this wretched conflict first, and only then can we get on to dealing with your agenda. And of course, I get that line of thinking. I mean, there's a lot to it. The trouble is that many of those same issues, climate change, human rights abuses, corruption, are also the drivers of conflict. So if you want to address conflict in a way that leads to sustainable peace, then you have to address those conflict, those, those issues too, and not just wait for them to be kicked into the long grass and uh, dealt with at some later point in time. And so what, I, what we're doing at Berkhoff, for example, is to try to bring in some of those tricky, sensitive issues that are so interlinked with conflict into our own peacemaking activities, especially to climate change and corruption, I'd say, and have decided to uh, put at the forefront of some of our activities in the coming years. So we're trying to build, put, bring together the conflict community and the corruption community in order to see how much each can benefit one another. And we can go into that in another time, but there is a lot that if, the, if each side had a slightly more improved, uh, improved perception of the activities of the other and the goals, I think both would be, more, would be more successful. And it's not just the NGOs, it is the donor agencies, the donor, the donor governments that support all the activities on, on climate corruption uh, piece that also need to be, be more together because at the moment even in the same agency you can't go to one and say look I've got a peace project but we want to bring in climate change and then they say well go and talk to the climate change people or go and talk to the corruption people so they're not speaking with one voice and uh, both sides both the donors and the activists have to do a far better job in pulling together and and, and creating the alliances that you are talking about because Back to my first point, if all these activists on corruption and all the other ones are facing the common enemy, they have got to be, a, 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 who are much more effective because they're often the same people, whereas we are all in our separate silos, um, not necessarily being able to, saying we need to get out of our silos, but actually not doing that. And so that is essentially where I think the most important thing to do for this whole movement of, of NGOs trying to maybe not having exactly the same goal, but whose agenda is fundamentally uh, complementary to one another. A lot more has to be done to pull us all together.
Thank you very much, Andrew. Also um, pointing out the importance of collaboration, but also emphasizing very vividly the intractable link between conflict and corruption and how these two processes tend to feed on each other and uh, often involve some of the same people. Uh, now I would like to uh, hear from uh, Ms. Olayobi Makinwa about her uh, views on this topic. Thank you very much indeed. I just want to say a big thank you to Transparency International uh, for inviting the UN Global Compact uh, to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, we have had a very strong uh, relationship with uh, Transparency International for many years, and we are really proud of that uh, interaction. Uh, for two decades, the UN Global Compact has mobilized a global movement of sustainable companies and stakeholders to create a world that we want. Currently, we have over 1,000, um, over 11,000 companies and 3,000 non-business organizations in 156 countries that have signed up to the Global Compact. They have committed to align their business policies and practices with 10 universal principles in support of human rights, labor rights, the environment and the fight against corruption. To achieve this, business must revisit their value system and install a principles-based approach to doing business. This means operating in ways that, at a minimum, incorporate the 10 principles into their operation. The 10 principle, the 10 principle of the Global Compact was added in 2004 to its nine principles that were adopted in the year 2000. It calls on businesses everywhere to fight corruption in all its forms, including extortion. Participants are to establish a culture of compliance with legal regulations, company policies and practices, and conduct business in an ethical manner. So companies are to proactively conduct a thorough corruption risk assessment adopt policies and programs to prevent and address corruption internally. Then within their supply chains, work with other companies and engage in collective action. As we all know, no one party can fight corruption alone. And let me use this opportunity actually to thank Boniface for your video, uh, for the film, I mean, fantastic. And I agree with you on all points. I also want to say here that while I agree with you on all points, the blame must not be placed totally on the side of uh, business also. That uh, we have, you know, from all sec sectors, whether from business, whether from government, whether even as private individuals, we all have a role to play in the fight against corruption. And what companies are doing in Africa, like you said, there's a lot of discretion also. People are misusing their discretion in the continent and therefore companies do have the opportunity to be able to do that. Now, coming back to what I was saying, that now, at the beginning of 2020, we were all excited for the new decade. It marked the beginning of the decade of action to deliver the sustainable development goals by 2030. Then COVID-19 struck. COVID-19 is not only a health, humanitarian, and socioeconomic crisis, the pandemic has also proven to be a test for good governance, accountability, public consciousness, trust, transparency, the rule of law for governments and businesses alike, and for all of us. The risk for corruption has become more dangerous than ever. And this is why now more than ever before that the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact uh, have become more relevant. Let me take you back to 1999 when the former UN Secretary General, Let's Kofi Annan, called on business individually and collectively to form a compact with the UN to give a human face to the global market, what he saw was the inequality and some of the challenges with regards to globalization. He realized that the only way out for all stakeholders was to come together to forge an alliance. The UN Global Compact is an alliance set up to realize cooperation among businesses and for, the, for businesses to work with government and other stakeholders to achieve a common purpose leading to a better society. 
is a model of how an alliance can be orient, oriented to realize goals that are set up by participating members. It is a worthy, worthy ideal that should be done, especially given the lessons learned from COVID-19. So for there to be a successful alliance, the business case has to be established as it was done with the business sector in 1999 by um, the late Kofi Annan. There was a business case. There has to be a meeting of minds for a common purpose, everyone looking forward to the common outcome. It, it requires that participants are clear on what the goals are and the successes, and that successes cannot be achieved with only one party seated at the table. And that was why um, Kofi Annan invited the private sector to come and sit with government and other, other stakeholders to address the challenges of uh, globalization. So the foundation for a successful alliance, therefore, is trust, is transparency, integrity, and candor from all sides. Let me go to the, uh, in, in terms of the problem question we are addressing today, which says that indeed we do have the laws, we have the institutions in place. I want to actually say that indeed we do have the laws in place. We have the UN Convention Against Corruption, which is very robust. We also have national laws. However, how many countries in the world have really domesticated the national laws robustly into their, you know, into their, uh, into the national laws? Where the laws are not domesticated fully, as well as the fact that uh, where they are not implemented com correctly or fully, then it leads to lack of trust and it leads to other issues. So it is important, therefore, for governments uh, to ensure that all the laws are incorporated into international, I mean, into the national laws. In terms of institutions also, which is also required when, when we try to form an alliance. In terms of institutions, under the UN Convention Against Corruption, many countries also have set up their own institutions, their national institution, to address the challenges of corruption. But many of them are not fully compliant with the UN Convention Against Corruption. Some of them have set up uh, national institutions, which at the end of the day also takes, uh, looks at uh, the issues of uh, other crimes. But corruption is an important issue that has, should have a national institution itself that will be independent, that will be given uh, enough resources. And this will lead to trust and confidence from the people uh, uh, from everywhere. And that's why today we have seen a lot of uh, uh, routing and other issues because there's no confidence in our laws, no confidence in the institutions that have been set up, even uh, by uh, governments all over the world. Now, also to strengthen alliances also, we need public trust in government and anti-corruption, uh, we need public trust in governments. We also need to strengthen alliances I mean, if, for us to strengthen alliances, we need more international cooperation and mutual assistance. Corruption is a global problem. It's all over the world. No more country can address it. So we need to reinforce our global commitment to the UN Corru Convention Against Corruption and ensure an equal playing field for all countries. Let me also say here that in, in, for us also to have trust and be able to build a honest alliance, we need the global north and the global south to come together. And there are some challenges right now that we are still facing. If you look at the issue of um, um, asset recovery, there are some issues between governments that have these resources, you know, that have been stolen, illegal, illegal wealth, and those where the resources are being kept. The resources, we know where they are, but what are we doing to ensure that those who, are the, who have lost these resources are able to repatriate the resources you know, in an efficient manner. We need, unless we have such honesty and candor, you know, operating, you know, uh, 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 I mean, as equals, it will be difficult for us to forge any alliance that is actually uh, important and that can actually address the challenges that we face today. We also need for any alliance, we need cooperation between multilateral institutions. We need to start talking about corruption as a cross-cutting issue. 
as the cause for human rights abuses, rising inequalities, and many others. Anti-corruption efforts are key in helping achieve socioeconomic development that is necessary to achieve the SDGs. The universal, the universal application for human rights, peace and security, and now in the COVID-19 era, the equitable distribution of vaccines and life-saving assistance. We must ensure you know, that the global north and the global south, that the, our people are able to receive the vaccines and not, that there are no obstacles uh, placed in the way of people being able to receive the vaccines. Thirdly, also, and another issue is that we must mobilize all actors of society to combat corruption before we can talk about any alliance. Corruption is bad for everyone. Everybody must know that. For governments, for companies, and for citizens and civil society. The private sector is a key actor in the fight against corruption. For companies, corruption impedes business growth, escalates costs, and poses serious legal and reputational risks. So we need to fight corruption together. It must not be that only developing countries are the corrupt ones. We must also ensure that uh, we look at corruption as something that affects each one of us uh, globally. And that's why we're actually coming to the fact that uh, this issue of asset recovery, we see the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. We see countries where the resources have been taken from, we see them high on corruption on CPI, but we don't see countries where the resources are being kept. Where are they on the corruption perception index? So if we want to forge an alliance or alliances, it is important for us to be able to sit at the table together uh, and be able to understand that this is an issue that concerns each one of us. So the, we, as the Global Compact, we are, we are mobilizing the private sector to scale up partnerships and collective action against corruption at the regional, national, and global level. We believe that multi-stakeholder partnership and collective action are essential for bringing an end to a systemic issue that is too complex for any one government to fight alone. In addition, also for any alliance, we need public, we need trust. We need also political will. There must be political will of governments to create an, a, a, um, a conducive environment and to ensure that the laws are being implemented fully and that national institutions are being set up to, to fight corruption. Unless we do that, unless we have political will from government, we also have the will from the private sector to address this issue. And we also need to bridge the gap between global north and global south in ensuring that we, we, we address this issue together. It will be difficult for us to have any alliance. And the alliance requires every one of us to come to the table, to the seat at the table with trust, with candor, with honesty, and to believe that we have to address this issue together. And that if, if I sit on the table at the table alone, unless I bring the other party to the table, this issue cannot be addressed. So um, I would like to end here to call on every one of us that it is important for us to speak honestly with ourselves and to come to the party, you know, in an equal manner as as friends, you know globally, Global South and Global North, to address this scourge, uh, which uh, many years ago had been called the cancer that's eating each and every one of us. And for every one of us also to understand that for every corrupt activity, there are human beings, there are people behind that. If we will understand that, we, it will be easier for us to forge alliances. But at the end of the day, there is no other way apart from multilateralism. But that multilateralism must be honest, must be, uh, there must be candor, and there must be trust and accountability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Olajobi was pointing out some uh, the role, important role of the UN Global Compact and its efforts to introduce a principle-based system also for big businesses to come to the table and private partnerships also um, with civil society in addressing corruption, making room for all actors at the table. I think these are really good points. Um, now I would like to ask for the thoughts of Mr. Um, Kim jong Kap. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm amazed to uh, listen to uh, three previous speakers. Uh, I felt I was uh, listening to great uh, philosophers uh, as uh, you, three of you have been uh, dealing with uh, all 
major global issues we are confronting as of now. I'm going to rely on uh, my slides, and uh, uh, I am asked to discuss specific cases of uh, collective action initiated by a group of Korean public organizations. Uh, according to an OECD report, 102 or 20% of world's 500 largest enterprises are state-owned. In Korea, we have 340 public organizations providing essential services in the area of uh, electricity, uh, water resource management, airport uh, management, railway transportation, uh, public finance, and so on. The budget of these 340 public organizations uh, is about 140% uh, that of Korean central government, or equivalent to 34% uh, of GDP. Uh, it constitutes quite a huge proportion of our national economy. Integrity assessment scores for public organizations in Korea have been improving uh, above the national average. And the Korean Board of Audit and Inspection has found that the cases of wrongdoing committed by uh, public organizations uh, have been uh, diminishing. Nevertheless, almost half of Korean people perceive public organizations remain corrupt. Well, uh, we have a huge homework ahead of us to root out uh, corruptive and unethical acts in the area of a public uh, organization. Well, to uh, uh, address the issue of corruption uh, in uh, public organizations, we recently launched a new initiative. Uh, 39 like-minded uh, CEOs of public organizations, including myself, gathered together to launch Public Enterprise Council for Transparent Society. Uh, actually, I chair this council and coordinate the collective action uh, programs amongst ourselves and work very closely with the uh, government entities. Uh, my very first uh, achievement is to uh, publish a report on success and failure cases of public enterprise integrity management. In this report, we are showing not only our improvements, but our shortcomings as well. In total, we have compiled 122 cases. Out of 122, let me introduce two cases. Uh, public organizations have often found defects in their recruitment and uh, promotion uh, system, uh, their uh, promotion policies and uh, processes. And so uh, we, the council has decided to collect uh, practices from 39 member organizations and came up with 24 best uh, cases and we share these best cases with all other public enterprises. And the central government has made, it, made these cases available to all other Korean government agencies throughout the country. So by doing so, uh, my council is making some contributions to a fairer and more transparent recruitment system in the public sector. Uh, case two, a Korean uh, National Park Service uh, has to limit the number of visitors uh, due to space constraint in some uh, national parks. Uh, however, those who uh, failed to be selected often registered complaints 
in the company's uh, Facebook account, and also at the same time, uh, these national parks suffered no show, uh, thereby adversely affecting uh, the park's revenue and profits. So uh, in order to resolve this issue, uh, the National Park Service is now live streaming selection process uh, on Facebook. So, uh, you know, all the applicants uh, could see for themselves what's going on there. So this is a very perfectly uh, transparent uh, process. And as a result, com number of complaints have dropped by 94% uh, and the no-show, number of no-show has uh, reduced by 43% and the national parks revenue and profit have substantially increased. So this new process works for everyone's interest. And now my council share this uh, experience with uh, those who are in need of introducing new selection process. My council's another achievement is that uh, our organizations, uh, our member organizations are being certified by ISO 37001. As you know, this is a world-renowned international uh, anti-corruption uh, standard. And uh, my council is providing uh, uh, training programs and consultations to to members who are uh, ready to be certified. And going forward, we plan to introduce this standard to all our subsidiaries and business partners. Well, the vision we have at the, our council is that we public organizations uh, play exemplary roles to combat corruption. Uh, more effectively and thoroughly. And uh, we will try to expand the membership and we'll continue to work very closely with the government and the civic groups. Well, we hope to uh, make Korea a better place to do business and also a better place to live for all. Well. Uh, I would like to introduce two more uh, cases uh, which are quite related to uh, Germany and uh, which are related quite closely to uh, UN Global Compact as uh, three of you are quite heavily involved in this. Well, uh, the first one is uh, collective action led by Business Ethics and Sustainability Management for Top Performance Forum, uh, best forum in short. Uh, for the past 18 years, um, more than 1,200 CEOs have been joining in these efforts. Here you could see two pictures. Uh, you may find my face somewhere. And in fact, I uh, co-chair this forum. And uh, this is uh, the ceremonies uh, where uh, CEOs are placing their uh, ethics management. The second one uh, is sponsored by uh, Siemens AG and uh, World Bank. And the first one uh, aimed to, to provide uh, uh, integrity training uh, programs to uh, college students and uh, 24 uh, Korean companies, major Korean companies, uh, presented their integrity policies to, to this student. This program lasted for three years, extremely successful. The second one, uh, Fair Player Club, uh, has been executed in partnership with uh, UN Global Compact Network Korea. And uh, this uh, aimed to uh, support uh, uh, Korean enterprise, Korean enterprises uh, for their efforts to introduce uh, ethical management 
integrity policies and execution of these uh, programs. And uh, this has been very successfully completed. And uh, as a result, and the UN Global Compact has become the partner for the third project here. And uh, this has been underway since last year. And this uh, project supports uh, legislation and uh, policy proposals uh, to help strengthen integrity standard in Korea. Well, this is all I can say to you. Uh, all three previous speakers uh, you know, were talking mainly about the global issues uh, we face as of now. I rather uh, focused on specific cases. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Kim jong Kap, for these uh, very interesting examples from Korea and the emphasis on um, the importance of businesses actually sharing their success stories as well as their failures to help others to improve. And I thought that these were some very interesting examples. Um, for, my, uh, for our final input on the topic, I would like to now go to um, Mr. Uh, Mauricio um, uh, Clever Caroni. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. And, and also, I would like to first thank Transparency International for inviting me uh, to participate and for the long partnership uh, we've had, a constructive partnership we've had, one that we only seek uh, to deepen. Look, transparency is a priority for the Inter-American Development Bank because we know that in each of our countries here in Latin America and the Caribbean, institutional failings and weaknesses can provide a breeding ground for corruption. Uh, this in turn corrodes public trust, it diverts private investment, it increases sovereign risk, it reduces productivity, and it undermines economic development and the rule of law. It's no wonder that every year the World Economic Forum survey reports that corruption and excessive bureaucracy are two principal factors hindering economic development in Latin America and the Caribbean. During the COVID-19 crisis, the massive price that our region, that our region pays for corruption has come painfully uh, into focus. Our governments can't afford fraud and abuse, and they should not tolerate any practices that hamper public health on the economic recovery. So how do we counter uh, corruption? How do we work to enhance transparency and integrity? At the Inter-American Development Bank, we promote transparency and integrity reforms aligned with international standards and digital technologies to improve the quality of institutions and regulations, to expand access to information for our citizens, and to strengthen the capacity of agencies responsible for promoting integrity and for controlling corruption. Let me give you some examples of what we do. As part of our commitment to the American Business Dialogue, we're working with CONFIEP in Peru to redefine the ethics regulations for the private sector, helping larger firms to ensure proper enforcement all the way down the supply chain, especially to small and medium-sized firms. We just finished helping the Banco de Desarrollo de Ecuador, the Ecuadorian Development Bank, to adopt the ISO 37001. Uh, the anti-corruption standard, ensuring that an independent certifying agency verify this institutional commitment. And one of our crown jewels here at the IDB is Mapa Inversiones, which uh, we launched in Colombia. Uh, and this platform enables citizens to trace the use of public funds in more than 17,000 investment projects with royalty resources. Since 2013, 12 countries in the region have adopted similar platforms, and that demand grows. Uh, we actually also recently launched our BUILT app, uh, which, which uh, as part of our Connect America platforms, allows for infrastructure projects in the region to have direct contact to local uh, uh, companies that, that participate in these infrastructure projects to try to cut out the middlemen, uh, those, those companies, or uh, those affiliated to governments that have been in the past such breeding grounds uh, for corruption. Of course, COVID hit and countries needed to respond as quickly to this health emergency as they did to demands for greater transparency and the use of resources. In March of this year, Paraguay asked the IDB for a solution. In less than six weeks, the Inter-American Development Bank with the government of Paraguay developed and launched Rindiendo Cuentas. This is an extension, kind of a new step forward in regards to Mapa Inversiones, which allows everyone to track every Guarani, the Paraguayan currency, invested in the COVID-19 emergency. Rindiendo Cuentas documents every contract related to the pandemic, along with cash transfers and subsidies to individuals and firms. 
It contains the financial disclosure forms of public officials and everyone can upload photos and videos. All the information is open source and anyone can make an allegation if something is not right. Fingiendo Cuentas was developed by the bank's transparency fund, which is financed and thank you uh, to uh, Norway, Canada, Sweden, and Italy, and has the technical contribution of Microsoft uh, and with the open contracting partnership. So it's another example of how we can all work together uh, to do great things in this sphere. Peru, Jamaica, and Argentina are similarly launched platforms recently, and Costa Rica went live on December 1st. Honduras, Ecuador, and the Dominican Republic are ready to launch and will soon be doing so. But we can do so much more. Obviously, from organizing policy dialogues like today to discuss frankly and openly how we can promote integrity to investing in world-class applied research. We want to expand our partnerships on transparency and integrity, such as with the OECD, uh, which recently took part, it took actually an IDB report and transformed it into the global toolkit for beneficial ownership transparency. These are only some examples of what we can do. And as we tell our private sector clients, you should compete on the quality of your products or on the interest rates you offer to your clients, but you should not compete on integrity. And that is key. That's a common good. That's what we strive for. And that's what we're doing here. And I appreciate being with all of you today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that um, contribution, Mauricio, about some of the developments that have been happening at the Inter-American Development Bank and um, the investments that are being made in platforms that produce more transparency and um, different toolkits that will hopefully help uh, business to have the ability to not compete on their uh, integrity. So now I'd just quickly like to um, shortly recap some of the things that we've already talked about to open it up more to the audience and also um, to refocus a little bit on the question that we had at the beginning. Um, so we've been talking about, and I think many of our speakers from uh, Mr. Moody Stewart to Mr. Gilmore to Ms. McKinwa all said that the importance of collaboration was key for fighting against um, the problems of corruption. This comes from different angles. The angle, first of all, that there is sometimes bad incentives in various places, bad incentives to reporting, bad incentives to being the whistleblower when you're not protected from this, as well as the incentive that often um, conflicts can uh, be things that produce um, corruption and vice versa, that these two things often are going hand in hand and people need to fight against them. At the same time, we had some examples of um, all the efforts of the private industries to work together to increase their transparency, to, um, to cooperate together, to do principles, uh, to focus on principles and better integrity. And yet, um, one of the key topics of this panel that I think we have uh, failed to address very comprehensively is the fact that despite the efforts of private business um, to cooperate with one another, to cooperate with civil society, and to cooperate with NGOs, there has been this simultaneous wave from the other side of politicians and governments in various countries to undermine uh, the very principles that we're talking about, to suggest that um, international cooperation is a globalist conspiracy or as a form of elitism that is actually having bad intentions. Uh, private business aside, it's the incentives also um, when your governments don't support these kind of, these kind of uh, cooperations, that obviously creates a conflict and a problem. So how does private business respond in the face of um, these kind of principles of global solidarity, cooperation, and mechanisms actually um, gets undermined by the governments of the countries that you're working in. I was wondering if any of you had comments for that, and then we'll go to some um, questions from the audience. Yes, uh, Mr. Modi Stewart. I think, I think what we see is an interlocking of, of things which go way beyond corruption, go into, into governance of countries and so on. These can only be solved and have to be solved in the end by action in each and every country. It's a country by country issue. Of course, there are things that can be done by other countries, but it really, we need to concentrate on what has to be done in a country. And that's why I'm a huge supporter of these local networks of the UN Global Compact, which do bring together 
responsible companies, companies who have made a commitment, they're not perfect, civil society, labor organizations, if they're there, working towards the 10 principles. Now, if it works, and it absolutely does not always work, but when it works, you can have a coalition which can then go to government, and it's not just business talking, not just human rights, civil society, labor organizations, it's a coalition saying, encouraging the government to regulate properly, where they have regulated properly to enforce it, and where they're doing the wrong things to complain about it. And I think that is a, 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 a strength. And I think there have been issues in, in uh, uh, corruption, extractive industries, transparency initiative, where such alliances have been important and signatories to that system have to commit not to go and beat up on their advisory councils and put them in prison. Some kind of collective defense. But it has to be done on a country by country basis. Can I come in here also, Christina? Yes, please. Yes, I agree with um, um, Sam Mark, you know, totally that it's, it's a country by country basis. I also want to say that actually even at the international level, we see a number of companies actually taking leadership, saying that, you know, although the com countries, there is no political will, but we are actually going to take the high road. We are not going to engage in corruption. We are going to engage in maybe even in collective action. We've seen so many collective action initiatives all over the world. So some companies are actually going beyond that. And investors, even in the area of uh, uh, climate, for example, you hear BlackRock taking, you know, some critical uh, decisions in terms of how they're going to invest. But let's not also forget, though, that the rhetorics by governments also can play, you know, a role in terms of how some companies will behave. Because many companies don't want to be seen on the wrong side of, uh, of, of, of the equation. At the end of the day, in many of our countries, governments do more business with companies than any other. And therefore, I mean, companies don't want to be on the wrong side of uh, the business. And the companies, we also have to face it, that the most important thing for a company is the return on investment. So if a company, if a government is saying, uh, attacking multilateralism and all that, it might have some effect actually on how some companies behave. So the rhetorics also will play some roles, but I believe that um, uh, many companies also are taking the initiative and becoming uh, leaders. If you, we had um, in September this year, during the UN 75 celebration, uh, a number of companies signed an initiative, you know, supporting multilateralism, despite all the rhetorics going on in the world, they were bold enough to be able to say that you can, I mean, you might uh, uh, attack multilateralism multilateralism, but this is the best for us. So in short, yes, indeed, it will affect companies, but some companies are saying we actually want to go beyond rhetorics. Thank you. Well, uh, I would like to give credit to uh, UNGC, and uh, as the Korean chapter of UNGC has been extremely active, they've been working very closely with uh, local, local uh, groups uh, for collective action. Uh, well, in addition to that, I might add that uh, we have to rebuild international institutions. People say that uh, globalization is in retreat. Yes, it might be true, but still, business is taking place globally. Therefore, global institution matters. For example, World Trade Organization, uh, well, regrettably, has not been so active in addressing global issues. And uh, therefore, to work, to fight corruption, to work together, I hope you could rebuild international institutions such as World Trade Organization. Thank you. If there are no other thoughts on um, that, then I'll move to some questions for the audience. 
Um, one of the first questions uh, is that there was a good point raised about the incestuous relationship between multinational companies and authoritarian governments and institutions in Africa. Um, the question is, how useful are legal frameworks like the FCPA in holding MNCs accountable and breaking this unholy alliance? Uh, let, me, let me also come in here. <laughs> yes, indeed, the FCPA are very important, especially for multilaterals, you know, or companies, engage, I mean, working in developing countries. Uh, but the countries themselves, also developing countries, have to implement their laws fully. They have to do that. You know, nobody will do that for them. Also, we also hear about multinational companies, you know, that are outsourcing corruption. These are issues that we also need to address. But that doesn't mean that all companies are doing that. We know that many companies, uh, I mean, given the FCPA, the UK Bribery Act and all over, and many of these laws, because of their extraterritorial effect, have actually, some of them have, I mean, the, I mean left some countries because of uh, the, the pervasive uh, atmosphere of corruption. But this, uh, we need to address it at the national level. There has to be um, uh, the FCPA, and then the countries themselves have to implement their laws fully. If they implement, and we have the FCPA, then, I mean, there will be a, a great uh, business environment, and corruption will be uh, reduced. Thank you. Can I jump in? Uh, so we need to actually go back a bit, and because you're jumping a few a few, you need to go back to like a century, two centuries ago. The problem you have is that the people who are trying to fight corruption are actually beneficiaries of corruption. So you talk about the countries that colonized Africa. That's the original scene. So let's talk about the museums in London, in Brussels, in Paris, across the world are full of stolen, stolen artifacts. Those countries have banks that have numbered account money stolen, stolen from the continent. Every year, Africa loses $60 billion in illicit flows going abroad. But no one raises an eyebrow about that theft because they don't treat corruption, they treat terrorism. If that much money is going to terrorism, they'll be concerned about that. So how about those countries to start treating corruption, then they treat terrorism? They follow every single cent. How about having an honest conversation about the land that was stolen from Africans across our continent the lands that still belong to the Belgians, the Germans, the uh, British, the French, uh, the Portuguese, on this continent, land that was stolen from our forefathers. So we can't start talking about corruption in 2020 without talking about how our lands were stolen, how our brothers and sisters were stolen, how those countries were built on the back of slaves. The moment you start doing that, then you're having an honest conversation. The moment you start talking about the money that has been stolen all through the years should come back. Because if you go to Swiss banks today, their money from Abacha, from Moi in Kenya, from Mugabe, from Mobutu, that money is on our continent. The dictators come and steal our money and store the money abroad. They allow multinationals to come and loot our money. So how do we deal with this uh, kind of corruption? By dealing with it the way, same way we deal with terrorism. The UN is not a responsible body. The UN has done a lot of things. You can talk about Haiti, for example, Rwanda, another country. So we can't even come and have an honest conversation about these things because even the UN as a body is corrupt. So I think the way forward, any company that wants to do business must invent, invest in leadership. They must say, we're going to do advocacy. We're going to look for leaders with integrity. We're going to find politicians who represent uh, progressive politics because Companies on this continent, because I want to talk about Africa where I live, they don't like dealing with advocacy or leadership unless they're bribing, because they know very well if you have very progressive leaders, even then they behind to account how they go to those deals. So it's a bigger conversation, and I don't think that the UA or even foreigners will solve our problems. Unless when they come and say, we are willing to have an honest discussion about how we got the land, how we got the deals, how we made our money, because if you don't do that, then there's no honest conversation. We can't start this story in 2020. Well, you know that there have been hundreds of years of African being looted, 
been plundered, been raped, and been stripped naked by multinationals. So the small thing that they do, maybe they give us donate, you have a conference there, you have a paper there, is very tiny, tiny drop in the ocean and do to make a difference. Can I, can I make a comment? Hi. Hi. Uh, just a, a couple of things. I think that we, it, it's really also about incentives, right? Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what, what country is the largest recipient of foreign direct investment in the world? It's actually the United States. And, and the reason why is because transparency in the rule of law is actually an incentive. And, and it needs to be clear to leaders throughout the world as well that corruption is actually a disincentive in that sense. You know, people from throughout the world look to invest in, in the United States more than any other country in the world, including from corrupt countries, uh, because there is a complex legal system that provides certain surety, uh, uh, contractual uh, sanctity, uh, et cetera. So it's actually an incentive uh, in that regard. In regards to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, I think that the issue is also incentives. I think all major economies in the world should have equivalents of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The problem that we're seeing in many places, and, and, and what I'm talking about is that other major economies, including some European countries, including China, uh, don't have Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or equivalents. And it's actually, they're using the fact that they don't as a competitive, a competitive advantage against US companies and in investing in different places in the world. I see that uh, daily in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it's not a complaint because American companies carry uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act as a badge of, of courage uh, and as a badge of honor because it's important. Uh, uh, but you see from other countries, including democratic countries, so it's not just China, but China and democratic countries, that then use the fact that they have lesser standards, lesser than, than even if the OECD standards, which are lesser than FCPA standards, in order to compete against uh, American companies. In, in these countries. I think that we should increase OECD standards. They should be at the part of FCPA and so that so that all other uh, major economies in the world, not, not to mention all other countries, but at least definitely major investors in the world uh, should have FCPA equivalents as opposed to using the fact that they don't as a competitive advantage for uh, uh, investments in other countries. That's an interesting point that, um, that you have raised. I wonder, though, uh, also relates to another question that we uh, have received. Uh, the idea that the rule of law and the adherence to it is an incentive for um, investment and that this drives investment that would tend to be sort of undermined by the last four years of the Trump administration that was uh, undermining the rule of law, even undermining the rule, the peaceful transfer of elections and using the pardon power in ways that are um, certainly not in coordination with international law and international standards. And yet the foreign investment in the United States remained at the same. Yeah, well, same. because I, if I'm, I'm, let me answer that because it is important. Um, the rule of law and institutions in the United States go beyond any president, any party, or anything of the sort. Uh, the United States is about institutions and the institutions uh, have, uh, have, have surpassed and surpassed uh, political parties and politics uh, in this country, which is why uh, regardless of what anybody's impression uh, or, or political preferences are, uh, at the end of the day, it's the strength of our institutions uh, that uh, that provide uh, that safety net and that and that importance for contractual san sanctity. And I think investors throughout the world know that, and that's why, regardless of who's president, regardless of the ideology, whether it's from the left or from the right, uh, et cetera, uh, there's always uh, foreign investment here in the United States because of the strength uh, of our institutions uh, in that regards. And I think that obviously speaks for itself. Certainly. I mean, undermining democratic norms from the highest position in the land certainly does have an impact, I think, on the way the United States is perceived globally. But the fact that it hasn't had a significant impact on business investment also relates to one of the other questions that we've had. We've been talking about some of the corruption and problems in Africa, and yet one of the other um, questions related to Europe and I think that that brings up a um, larger point, which is that despite the fact that there are corruption issues that are more visible in certain countries, especially in developing countries, that issues of corruption are actually flowing from all directions and are also seen in um, many developed Western countries as well. 
for example, our question was whether the government failure to detect the Volkswagen and Boeing regulatory failures provide evidence of increasingly increasing regulatory failures, issues that involved huge corporations that are very profitable. And I was wondering if anyone had comments on uh, that audience question. I think the, uh, I mean, if you look at those uh, two uh, examples, Boeing, I personally think that, that Boeing was a failure of governance. It's not really a question of, of corruption in, in an immediate sense. Uh, Volkswagen, I think, was clearly uh, maliciously financially driven, as it were. It was a clear effort to wire around improperly uh, in order to, to gain or maintain uh, market. Uh, but I, I think the, so there is no country in the world which does not have corruption. I mean, we kid ourselves if we uh, think, you know, Singapore is held up as being, I could tell you stories about Singapore, you know, I know the form of corruption which occurs in, in Singapore, very subtle. Uh, so, but nonetheless, Singapore is a great country, but it doesn't mean it's perfect. So if you go down the transparency list, even the ones at the top have examples. Uh, we just need to be aware in its multiple uh, facets. But I would support uh, Bonifast in his comment about uh, uh, the uh, finances that are located in, in major Western markets, which it is a, there is some progress being made with revealing beneficial ownership, but it's a long, slow and uh, tough fight. Uh, Transparency International took in France a, a private prosecution because the state wouldn't do it against the son of a, a West African dictator who you probably all know about. And they won the case and the guy's uh, assets were all confiscated. I actually made a donation to Transparency to support the case because it got me so cross. But what's happened? The funds still sit in France and it's gonna take a long, long time before that goes back to the country uh, concerned. So I agree with Boniface's point there. I could have some good arguments with him, uh, open and frankly about some of his other points, but we'll leave that for the future. I think that uh, we could probably have lots more arguments. Unfortunately, we are at the point where we need to um, start wrapping up. So I would just like to um, raise uh, some of the points that were brought up that I think um, were key to what all of our speakers were saying. First of all, that um, that these issues that we're talking about must be faced jointly, that they require a sense of collaboration between the private and the public sector, as well as with governments, civil society, NGOs, and that um, we need to consider the various types of experts that exist and bring them all to the table in order to sort of tamper down on some of the incentives that are bad, such as those incentives that stop people from reporting corruption or that incentivize them to profit from corruption. Um, at the same time, as uh, Mr. Gilmore was raising, that uh, there needs to be a sort of common resistance among these different sectors towards the uh, issues that are creating corruption and creating conflict. And, um, you know, keeping in mind that there's also a uh, media angle to this that tends to spread this sort of um, disinformation that uh, leads to people feeling that they're part of separate groups. Uh, as Ms. McKinwa was talking about the um, role of the global contract, the idea that there should be more principles within businesses is, is part of sort of trying to infect uh, all parts of a all parts of a um, of a civil society, including the business angles of it, with ideas that can improve the lives of the people that they serve, and to also make sure that um, everybody is brought to the table, that you don't just leave groups of people out. Um, Mr. Kim Jong Kap was also talking about the gap between the public perception of different businesses as opposed to what is actually occurring on the inside 
and that one way to sort of bridge this gap is to deal with uh, or to have increased transparency. Um, Mr. Clever Caroni was talking about the excellent um, efforts by the uh, IDB to help trace different funds to increase transparency among um, businesses. And at the same time, um, I think a very good point has, was continuously raised by Mr. Boniface that there's historical antecedents to all of these issues that the issues of colonialism and transfer of wealth from different countries to others has not been erased as it continues right now with the spread of dark money, kleptocracy and corruption. So unfortunately, we didn't solve any of these problems for today, but I want to thank all of the panelists for their very interesting contributions to our discussion. And I would invite all of you um, to watch uh, the documentary about Bonifat Plus at the, um, uh, at the Pathable app for under Soft D as part of the um, film festival. Thank you very much uh, to Transparency International and to the IACC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much for all of you for sharing your knowledge and your uh, precious time for us. Uh, we would like to express our gratitude to Mr. Kim jong up President and CEO of CAPCO, and Mr. Mark Moody Stewart, Chairman of United Nations Global Compact Foundation, and Mr. Marcio Klebukaran, President of Inter-American Development Bank, and yeah, Mr. Andrew Gilmore, Executive, Executive Director of uh, Bank of Foundation, and also Ms. Uh, Ola, Ola Lobi Makinwa, uh, Executive Director and CEO of United Nations Global Compact, and Mr. Boniface Mwanji, uh, Kenyan photojournalist, and our moderator, Ms. Christina Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you very much. And I'd like to inform the uh, tomorrow's session for all of you, the first plenary session under the theme of breaking bashes size cycles of dirty money and in punit will be begin from 12 p.m. Greenwich time and 9 p.m. Korean time for tomorrow. So we would like to ask for your support and interest for this session. Thank you very much.